Good morning, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Oh, that wasn't very loud. I don't, I, I can't deal with that. Good morning! Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm very enthusiastic. Uh, so I want to preface a couple of things before I get started, okay? I'm very much a bitter truth guy. I just can't say how it is, you don't like it. Sorry. Just how it is. Uh, but, but, I'm very passionate about what I'm about to talk about. And I think for me, and what I think for you, obviously I don't know all of you personally, I don't think it's all, get to know all of y'all later as the movie continues, but I really feel like this subject can be a turning point for your life. And I truly believe that as a huge turning point for my life. Um, and so I just, I'm really excited about this. So if you have pens, notes, I'm about to get nerdy. This is more of my, one of my more nerdy talks. Uh, a lot of my, if y'all follow me on Instagram or anything, a lot of my stuff is like uh, motivation and stuff, but deep down, I'm a huge science nerd. So we're going to go through that today. So whole foods for whole you. So before I get started, let's kind of talk about who I am, because I think like, you know, obviously, if I've never painted, I should be instructing you on how to paint. That doesn't even make sense. So I'm a Christian first and foremost. I'm a nutritional therapist. I'm a husband, right? There's my wife and my daughter, my little 17-month-old Haley. Uh, I'm an ultra runner. I like to put myself through a lot of pain and cry, and it's great. It's all me. Um, I'm an eating disorder advocate. I had bulimia severely for eight years, um, and I've been three and a half years in intermission without a relapse. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm a business owner. I own a nutrition coaching company, a supplement company, and some other little things I like to dabble in. And then I'm a public speaker. That's what I'm doing right now. So yeah, it's all here, yeah. There you go, there's proof. Um, <laughs> so. First of all, let me talk about this idea of like whole foods. Like why do foods matter? And I think this is super important. So this was me uh, on the left. That was me at 14. I was 259 pounds, okay? Uh, I was an emotional eater growing up. Food was my vice of control. Uh, There's a lot of things in my life going on that just weren't in my control. You know, what was in, you know what was in my control? Hand to mouth. Hand to mouth, right? And so that's what I controlled. And I was good at it too. Oh, let me tell you. I'm good at what I want to control, and I did. I controlled it, and it really made me balloon up at a very young age. So I lost the initial 75 pounds through a very standard bro diet, right? Like my literally, I kid you not, my diet was lean protein shakes, skim milk, spinach leaves, chicken breast, and Captain Crunch. That was it. Like it was fat free and a bunch of carbs. I used to get the Benny Crocker butter bowls. Anybody have a parent? That's not my mom. That's why, you know, like, you don't know if it's chili or beef stew or butter, like, you just don't know. Well, I would use them and I would fill that full of cereal and skim milk every morning because there was no fats. I just go crazy. Um, and the reality is, is that because carbohydrates and protein are lower per gram with the calories, I did lose the weight. And I was also very young, I was very active, right? But I was destroying my body hormonally, and I had no idea at the time. Um, and so eventually it started to bounce back. And when it started to bounce back, I had to deal with a lot of psychological issues because for me, I was bullied a lot when I was overweight. Unfortunately, teenagers are evil people, <laughs> right? And when I lost all the weight, um, I started to get girlfriends. I started to get friends. People started to stop making fun of me. So I associated being thin with being accepted. And at that time, I did not accept myself. And so I cling to that social acceptance. And I was not willing to give up. I was willing to hurt myself for someone to like me. Right, and so bulimia stepped in. One day, I couldn't control my binges because my diet was just terrible, and I started putting my finger in my mouth. Sorry, I'm really bitter. I'm kind of to the point. Um, and at first, it was just cheat meals, and then it was every day, and then it was at school, it was at home, it was in the shower, so my parents wouldn't catch me. All oh, it got really bad. Um, and even after it kind of eased up, I found my face when I was 16, and that really helped me just you know quit because. For me, it gave me work outside of myself. And I was like, I can't just destroy this body. I gotta work towards something. So it really helped me kind of start fighting it. But I never really could, you know, it went from every day to once a week to once a month. And it never really like fixed itself. So I lost the game the same 50 pounds for nine years. I would just go back and forth, back and forth. Who here has like lost the game the same 20 pounds for years? Right? And it's just like, 30. <laughs> but it's just like, what is going on? Like. Because you lose the weight, you get excited, and then you're like, you know what, I'm gonna celebrate, and then you go off and you gain all back. And people don't realize that like, that's a really unhealthy cycle. That's a really unhealthy cycle. It, it's, a, it's a fruit of something deeper. It's a fruit of something deeper. And so I realized 
that my food choices directly influence my control, right? This is more than just calories. This is more than just calories. I found a ketogenic diet in 2017, and I went not on, the, on the ketogenic diet, I went nine months without a relapse, which is the longest I had gone without relapsing on my bulimia since I developed it, right? But I still relapsed. So that's another, we're talking about psychology here in a little bit. This is deeper, but the point is that that foundational diet gave me a, a sense of control. I didn't have, I did not have. I could go and eat whatever, any diet website, bodybuilding.com, which is like the bro science, don't go there, it's not good information. Um, but and I would still purge, I would still purge. And it wasn't until I started to adopt a whole food ketogenic diet that control was given to me. And I talked about that yesterday when we did the opening ceremony. It's like, guys, this diet is not just about weight loss. It gives you control. Eating well gives you control. It gives you, it really does. So, it, like I said, it, it, it's more than a diet, right? Like while the keto diet helped lay a foundation, it was not the complete answer to the word going on inside my head, right? Addiction, not just sugar, the experience. We're gonna talk about that here in a second. Y'all aren't gonna like me at some of these points, sorry. Um, but so you can see I lost weight, I got I gained muscle, I leaned out, and then I'm kind of where I'm at now. I'll give you an idea of my shirt. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but I maintain that year round now. I could not have done that four years ago. No way. Three years ago, no way. Even when I first started keto, I could not maintain that. It's impossible. And people think like, oh, I can't maintain. It's like, man, you'd be surprised what you can do when you're empowered with your food choices. You'd be surprised. You really would. So I think one thing to understand is, I'm gonna take you through a little journey here, okay? What's the difference between whole foods and processed foods? Okay, so this is Process Patrick. Everybody say hi, Process Patrick. Oh, I love it, y'all are good. All right, so according to studies, okay, these are studies, likely to eat up 500 more calories a day than his maintenance calories, okay? He has a higher chance of mortality, increased risk of hypertension, increased risk of asthma, increased risk of IBS, and increased risk of depression. Both of those that are blue, if you email me, I'll give you my email at the end of the site. If you want to email me, I will send you this presentation so you can go to these studies. They're all hyperlinked to it, okay? So, Process Patrick is not a good place, okay? And these are controlled, peer-reviewed studies. You can't get around these facts. You are likely to overeat on a processed diet. And here's, here's the kicker. This doesn't differentiate between a processed keto diet and a processed standard American diet. Mm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get you grills. It's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so increased risk of hypertension, right? Like, like, like serious heart issues. Life expectancy is gonna go down. And increased risk of uh, depression. Here, here are the ones that really get to me, right? Patrick has an increased chance of becoming anorexic, bulimic, and developing a binge eating disorder. Here's what's crazy. So in that study that's linked here, it talks about all three of these. And what they found was that if people had a 70% processed diet, they had a significantly higher chance of having these. In fact, everybody that had these, 70% of their diet was ultra processed. 70%. Guys, anorexics don't eat. Binge eaters eat a lot. Bulimics eat and then purge it out, right? Like, they're very, very different eating disorders, but they all had one common trait. What was it? Processed food. They all had this common trait that links them together, okay? Now, let's be hopeful, Holly. Holly's happy. Everybody say hi, Holly. Yeah, Holly's happy to see y'all too. She's always in a good mood. So she's more likely to be able to lose and maintain healthy weight based off studies. She has a reduced chance of cardiovascular disease. We'll have lower levels of inflammation blood markers such as A1C and CRP. And she has a decreased risk of depression and other mental issues. Guys, these are, these are just facts. You can't get around these. You can try, but you can't. The reality is, is that whole foods, by far and large, are gonna put you in a better place, not just physically, but mentally, right? These studies talk about mental health issues, not just physical health issues, right? And again, it doesn't differentiate between a processed ketogenic diet and a standard American processed diet, right? So some of us go on keto right now, because so who, who just started keto in the past year? Anybody? It's okay, you can be honest. I'm not gonna judge, okay. I'm telling you, huh? Recently, yeah, who restarted this year? Yeah, I love it. I'm all about hey. Hey, I was talking to Clubhouse the other day, and I said, you know what? We're not we're not superheroes, but we're, we're humans are really good Avengers. We can bounce back, <laughs> right? We can. I love it. Um, when I first started keto, dude, the only bar on the market was literally something called the keto bar. It was y'all you know what I'm talking about? The keto bar. It was gross. 
Oh, so because I had to like eat it with when I first started keto, I didn't know what I was doing, and I like had to eat it with just peanut butter to get it down because I wanted a bar, you know. Uh, but there was nothing. You were forced to eat a whole food diet. The same thing happened with paleo. Like paleo, paleo at its core, because that's something I specialize into is paleolithic diets. Like, is a great diet. The problem is now everything you can literally live off packaged goods and be paleo. You can. You can live off of packaged goods and be keto. Literally, right? People literally go and they. They go, I'm going to go keto, and they literally choose one bread under at the store. And they're like, same thing, more fiber, more gluten, let's go, right? It's the same thing, right? And so understand that like these things impact us, and they can hinder you. They can be hindering you right now. That's my big thing, right? Like, and I'll get into this idea of a 90-10 rule here in a little bit, but I think this is an important point. It's like majority of your food should be whole food if you really want to see change because we know, we have proof, that it does matter. So what is a whole food? Let's talk about that. What is a whole food? So a whole food, a food that has been processed or refined as little as possible and is free from additives or other artificial substances. If it grows out of the ground or makes noise, it's fair game. I meant to put except humans, but I totally forgot to check that out. Um, but hey, I mean, I, I don't know. Whatever you do at home, it's fine. Uh, but um, so, and the reason why I really want to explain this is because technically our beef is processed. You'll get that argument a lot from like, Registered dietitians that want to like crap on you trying to find food freedom, they'll be like, well, yeah, but your beef is still processed. I mean, not really. I mean, yeah, it's technically cut because anything that gets taken from its original form and changed is technically a process. But a whole food is defined as something that is processed as little as possible. So just fire that back at them, and when they get mad, just scream their credentials at you and how you don't have a voice, just ignore them. They're crazy. Um, but if it grows out of the ground or makes noise, it's fair game. That's generally how I do it, right? Like, you know, any kind of animal, any kind of vegetable, right? Like, and again, the core of a ketogenic diet is kind of like an ancestral paleolithic look at things. It's just we're going to increase fat and lower carbs, right? So that we get a more fat adapted outcome, which is what we want, okay? So now we've got to ask, well, what is a processed food, okay? So there's two kinds of processed food. There's two categories. There's minimally processed and there's ultra processed. So minimally, so a food that is processed through mixing the whole foods, additives, etc. There are different levels of processed foods, like I just said. Minimally processed, okay? So slightly altered for the main purpose of preservation, but it does not substantially change the nutrition content of the food. I use keto brick as an example. I love keto bricks, and you know, some people, it's not for everybody. It's whatever, you can not have good taste, it's fine. Um, but I like them a lot, especially the peanut butter cup. Link in my bio. Um, but, so, what I like about them is that I've been in their kitchen, and I, because I used to work for them before I bought my own companies, and I'm not going to give you the recipe, I'm sorry, it's confidential. But they use cacao butter, and they mix these, they mix protein powder and some other things, and they make these bars. It literally is like a 30, it's like a 30 minute process. It's super quick. All they're doing is adding the cacao butter to the ingredients to preserve them, and lock them in, because cacao butter is a fat, so it's not going to mold or go rancid, and it keeps things stable at room temperature. That's the trick, right? So it's minimally processed and it's nutrient dense, right? It's full of stearic acid. We're gonna get into it later. I don't really like stearic acid. <laughs> no, stearic acid is awesome. Uh, so that's like a minimally processed food. And then you have ultra processed. Who here likes frosted flakes? Y'all not like frosted flakes? Hey, listen, like, they're good, right? Like I don't eat them. I don't eat them in half a decade, but they're good. Uh, but they're made. They're, they're ultra processed. Process. They have a long ingredient list with additives, seed oils, and high fructose corn syrup. Everyone say ew. Yeah. Um, made mostly from substances extracted from foods such as fat, starches, and added sugars. So what it means there, and I really wanted to explain this. So it means like, so when you take a, when you take a, um, I forget the seed, but when you take the seed that makes canola oil, you're going through a huge, oh I don't remember it anyways. Um, you go through this huge process to get to the oil. It takes like 10,000 seeds to get a tablespoon of canola oil. That's called ultra processing because you're taking it so far from its natural form, it's not even the same thing. It just has one substrate of one macronutrient from that food. That would be ultra processed, okay? Here's what's crazy. Now, there's not, I haven't found a keto package yet that has high fructose corn syrup. I'm waiting for it, but I've seen some other things. You go to Costco, there's a big old keto, and everybody's like, yeah, it's Costco, you know, and you grab it, you go home, you eat some, you feel like crap, you're like, what's wrong? You check the label after you already bought it, yeah, we all do that. And it's like, second ingredient's rice syrup, and you're like, ugh. <laughs> it happens, right? That is still an ultra-processed food. Do y'all really want to go through the process of making rice syrup? It's kind of gross. 
right? But we eat it because it says keto on it, right? And then also seed oils. That's just a reality, right? If it has seed oils, if it has soybean oil, if it has canola oil, vegetable oil, it's an ultra-processed food, right? We kind of get excited because it doesn't have carbs, but I feel like sometimes our avoidance of carbs and that hyperfixation makes us not focus on other parts of our diet. And it really it makes us blind to some things. But the reality is that like there's a lot of keto products that are ultra processed and they're just as bad as the other stuff. I know, I know people argue, they're like, but it doesn't have the carbs, yeah, but it has a lot of other stuff that's destroying your body from the inside. Remember, you are what you eat. Something I said at my last talk was I have a thing against Twinkies, I've never liked them, and like so I rag on them a lot because they're just gross. But like realize that if you eat one, right? Let's say you eat a Twinkie, your cells, like everybody look at their hand. Everybody look at their hand, everybody, everybody. At some point, they're gonna be made out of Twinkies. <laughs> you gotta understand that because all of the cells in your body have a cell membrane and they're all made through fatty acids. And so the fats from that Twinkie at some point will be digested, absorbed, assimilated, and turned into your cell membranes. You're literally gonna be made out of that at some point. Like that's a reality that we have to come to grips with. That's like, that's something that really helps me with my diet is when I look at something, I go, don't wanna be made out of this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it really helps. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to differentiate. I want to kind of talk about the contrast here. So what we have here is whole meat versus processed meat. Now, I use prime rib. I don't know, it's like a really high-end meat. I don't always, I actually, I, I never eat prime rib. But it looks good on Google, so that's what we went with. Uh, any beef works, it's fine. So what we see here is we see this is for three ounce servings of both, okay? So we're going to attack meat first, right? We're not just going to go after package goods. So prime rib is 343 calories, 29 grams of fat. Fun fact, and I know Sean Baker talks about this a lot, and he's so sure, and it blew my mind when I found this out. People go, oh, you eat red meat? It's saturated fat. No, it's not. It's actually half saturated, half monounsaturated. Yeah, yeah, look at that. 12 grams of saturated. It has more monounsaturated fat than it is saturated. Right? So when people say that, just ignore them, because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and then it has a one to three omega three to six ratio, right? Which is decent. 18 grams of protein, 40% of your daily requirements of vitamin B12, and then you can see your phosphorus, potassium, iron, and selenium. And then the real cool part, check this out, no preservations or additives. It's just like that, isn't that cool? It's just there, it's like, wow, this is just here, it's awesome. Now let's look at pepperoni nutrition, okay? Now realize too, some of these numbers are concentrated not because it's better, but because all the water is removed, therefore it's more concentrated. And we're going to talk about why that can be an issue here in a second. But, so, it's obviously super high in sodium. So, 494 calories, 44 grams of fat. Still, look at the monounsaturated and saturated. That's crazy. 15 grams of saturated, 17 grams of monounsaturated. 16 grams of protein. It has, actually has a lot of selenium, which is really interesting to me. But, again, it's concentrated because the, the water's been removed. Um, and here's the thing. Pepperoni has a lot of preservatives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, isn't that weird people out when they go to like grab a new bag and it's been on your shelf for like a year? And you're like, this is edible still. <laughs> like, yeah, it's something to think about, right? Like and the other day I was actually writing this, I was, I was writing this talk and, and, and uh, Ashley wanted to make pizza and I went to grab the pepperonis because, and we'll talk about that in a bit, like 92 and all, it's important. But like, I was like, I'm not eating those today. <laughs> That's not happening. Because like it said, like it said, the expiration date was like three years from now. And I was like, bro, this is supposed to be a pig. What is going on? <laughs> right? Um, and then realize too, okay, this is really important, right? So like when we go for this, and I understand it's convenient at times, but when we go for this majority of the time, and let's say that you're carnivore or you're someone that just tracks carbs only, that's totally fine, you could be way overshooting calories. Realize that just because it's a meat doesn't mean that they don't do things that make it hyper palatable. You have to understand a fact. Anything that's processed by a major company, it's not its not like a bunch of chefs get together and they're like, oh, this tastes really good, let's put it in the package. No, no, no. There are lab coats that sit in a really cold metal uh, sanitary room that make these things and then sit down with this board of directors and they do not put it on the shelves until the directors don't want to stop eating it. You know, I'm going to say that again. Until they don't want to stop eating it. Processed foods are engineered to make you want more. They're designed to cause addictive habits. That is a reality that we all have to understand, right? And so if you can't handle having them, I'm telling you, you shouldn't be eating them. You DM me and you're like, John, I really like this. I'm like, cut it out. Throw it away. Burn it. 
I don't know. And some people go, well, I see he's a homeless person. And I'm like, no, I don't know. It's on the shelf for three years. That's scary, man. You really want to feed that to them? But like, but like but then seriously though, like, if, it, if you notice that it's something that you cannot handle, you have to be okay with just saying, I can't eat this, right? We have this, uh, these terms, moderators and abstainers. I'm going to get off on a side tangent here. So moderators are people that can have something every now and then and just go back on the plan. The beauty for moderators is that they don't even realize they're moderators because that's how easy it is for them. They're just like, you know, we all have that friend that can do keto, and then they have those guys that kick at the birthday party, and then they go back, and it's not a big deal because it's such a small amount of their diet that it doesn't impact their health. Whereas, like me, right, if I eat a slice of cake, I haven't had, I haven't had a slice of actual cake in a long time. Uh, I don't know what would happen. I don't want to find out. But we all know those people that, like, they take a bite of something, and they can't put the fork back down. You have to be okay with saying, I cannot eat this ever again. I was talking to a friend, and she has a soda addiction. And she's like, John, what do I do? I was like, stop drinking soda. You're not complicated. Like, stop drinking soda. And she's like, but forever? Like, and I was like, all right, give me six months. She said, okay, but after six months, maybe? And I was like, the fact that you're worried about having it six months from now is a huge red flag that you have a problem. Like, when they're like, oh, but I don't want to have dessert ever. I don't want to not have dessert ever again. I'm like, but you're already thinking about having dessert again, even though it's years, years away. Like, that's a huge red flag, right? And so, like, understanding who you are and having that self-awareness, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much you feel like it alienates you from your friends, realize that until you are the best you, you're not giving them your best, right? And you're not giving yourself your best. So you have to be willing to have those truths. You have to have those really hard conversations. There's a reason why I don't eat certain things, ever, right? People go, why do you stay consistent? I'm like, because I know me. Because I know me, that's why. And if you don't know me and you're asking that question, leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, I'm blunt. <laughs> All right, so now let's let's get a little bit more focused. Let's talk about whole fats versus processed fats. Okay, so on the left we have beef fat. Uh, that's literally they cut it off the cow, they cubed it up, they put it in a bowl. Done. Huh. Have y'all ever like rendered that down and like fry something? Oh man, that's, I'm telling you. Ooh, I'm hungry. Um, right, it's not processed, right? It's a stable fat, which is important. It's full of steric acid. Do you know what steric acid is? No. Oh my gosh, steric acid. It's my best friend. So steric acid is a saturated fat, and they have been finding that lately, these studies have been coming out, that it is one of the main contributors to helping your body release fat from your fat cells. So it's a huge, because it, because it, because it basically it lets your body know you're thriving, and you don't need to conserve. And I'm not saying that if you start eating like, you know, pure beef fat, that you're going to melt. I'm saying you have a chance. <laughs> Uh, but no, but seriously, like, like making sure you have a good amount of saturated fat in your diet is super important. Not just because of the steric acid, but because saturated fat is a huge precursor to sex hormones. And so many people remove that, and then, you know, because the doctor says, you need to go on a low-fat diet. Okay, let's put you on testosterone and all this other stuff. Right? It's super important to have saturated fat. And steric acid is so important for fat loss. Um, it has a one-to-one, -one, relatively, saturated to monounsaturated fats, and then a one-to-two to a one-to-three omega-3 to six, depending on if it's grain-fed or grass-fed. Okay, now let's look at canola oil. Ooh, look at that. That's nasty. You want to see something nasty? Go YouTube the making of canola oil. I guarantee you, you'll never eat it again. It's really bad. It's really bad. Also, fun fact: it used to be uh, it's used as machine lubricant, and until Crisco came out in 1920, that's what it was for. And they said, "I wonder if we could." Oh man, this machine's running so good. I wonder if we can eat this. That makes sense. And then they made Crisco. And then Crisco didn't do well because we had bacon fat, which made sense. And then Eisenhower in the 1950s had his heart attack, and that's when the real swing and push came for that, right? So canola oil is very processed. Very processed. I don't even need to, like, like it takes that, it, I don't remember the exact number right now, but it takes, like, a whole acre makes, like, five bottles, six bottles of canola oil. Like, that's how processed this stuff is, right? Um, it's an unstable fat. What that means is when it's in front of light. So when light hits it, it gets what's called rancid, right? And what you'll hear a lot is like poof, it's polyunsaturated fats um, are like the enemy. And don't get me wrong, a high amount of them are, right? But they're still essential. Like omega three and six are essential fatty acids. We need them, right, in certain amounts. But what really makes these bad is how rancid they are, how oxidized they are, and how inflamed they make your body. Okay. Like I said, this isn't the light temperature in plastic. And if you've ever been inside of a food truck, which I have, 
Um, there's a lot of light, there's a lot of warmth, and there's a bunch of plastic. So they're in that, the whole process, right? And then it's been linked to high inflammation cardiovascular disease. In fact, they just came out with a study last year, a meta-analysis, where they took back what they said about it. They were like, um, so we went through all these studies that promoted this is good, and I, we think you got it wrong. Can you imagine that, like 50 years of like making people worse and going, you know, actually, I respect them for saying it, honestly. I really do, because it takes a lot of galls to say you're wrong and you're mistaken. But in that meta-analysis, they actually said that what they're finding is that it's lowering life expectancy. The consumption of processed seedlings is lowering, lowering life, life expectancy because what are our cells, what are our cell membranes made out of? Fat. fat, fatty acids, fatty acids, right? And so if you're eating a bunch of rancid fatty acids, your cells are rancid. Ugh, ugh. Think about that for a second. Huh. Okay. I, like, I shivered when I was writing this. Um, but yeah, so like understand that, right? And, and understand that there is a difference, okay? And again, I'm giving you a lot of hard, bitter truths. We're going to, I'm going to ease up here in just a little bit, but not yet. So, okay, before I get into the next subject, I want to make some, uh, there's a warning clause here, okay? I really, I really wanted to say this. So carbs are not a topic of discussion if you just started keto, right? What I'm about to say is it's really not for you if you just started. If you just started, you need to get fat adapted, you need to get keto adapted, you need to let your body go through that process of healing, and then once that happens, this can be a topic of discussion. And for some people, it needs to be a topic of discussion. Uh, you must first become fat adapted, right? This is not an excuse to eat cheesecake and ho-hos. I don't know why I said ho-hos, but it sounded funny. When I said it, I was like, I was not allowed to eat ho-hos. I don't even know what our hobos are. Um, but yeah, like, so like, because people do that, they'll be like, oh, well, I'm gonna add carbs back in my diet, and like, it's cheesecake. And it's like, well, no wonder you felt like crap. You started eating like an American again. <laughs> right? Okay, and then do not follow dogma. This is super important to me. Do not follow dogma. Follow health. You need to do what's best for you. 1,000% of the time. And if that goes against your greatest influencer's directions, but you feel good and it's making you thrive and it's sustainable for you, well, give up the thumb. Give them the hand. Good job. You know, whatever. Well, you can, I mean, I'm being nice. So I'm like, give them the, you know, handle the thumb maybe one. Um, and then understanding the 90 10 rule. Okay, so what is the 90 10 rule? So the 90 10 rule is what I live by. A lot of people do an 80 20, but I'm a little bit more intense. So a 90 10 rule is 90% of the time I follow a very, very strict protocol. Like, I eat the way that I eat and no one's gonna make me deviate. 10% of the time, I go off it. So for me, what that looks like is 90% of the time, I eat whole foods, and that's all macronutrients. That's fats, proteins, and carbs, whole foods. 10% of the time, I eat keto treats. I'll like, have something good, a baked good, something with sugar, alcohol in it, whatever, right? For some people, 90% of the time is you know keto, and then 10% of the time, they don't eat keto at all, right? And that's between you, your maker, and yourself. But 90, 10, 90% of the time whole foods, 10% of the time keto treats works really, really well for me. And I would encourage you to try it because I think it works really well. So I just want to make sure that I did those disclaimers before we continue. So whole carbs versus processed carbs. And this is a, a big discussion that I have a lot because um, as I've developed my coaching business, I went from really focusing on my body dysmorphia and stuff and how that impacts keto to kind of also adapting uh, men's health. And then that translated into women's health because I was only working with a couple of men, but I had a lot of uh, middle-aged women coming to me needing help because they've been doing keto for three years and they weren't losing weight anymore and they felt like crap and their hormones were crazy. And I had to figure out, like I, I had to become, I had to start self-educating because I didn't know what I was doing. Clearly, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. Uh, so I had to learn, right? I had to learn. And there's a lot of things that I learned on this journey over the past couple years. And it's why I have the passions that I have now. So first, let's talk about sugar alcohols. And I think this is a very important conversation because a lot of us love sugar alcohols. Right? Who here likes sugar alcohols? Nobody? Oh, I like that you, I kind of like that you don't, right? But I don't know. All right, so. Couple things about them that you have to understand. You have one, you have to understand the gut sugar alcohol relationship. This is super important. So sugar alcohols can overfeed your gut microbiome. Okay, so you have your stomach, you have the three parts of your small intestine, right? So you have your duodenum, your jejunum, your ileum, you have your ileocecal valve, and then you have the three parts of your colon. Okay, your body. I know I told you I get nerdy. Your body does not start breaking them down into the colon. But I'm going to say breaking them down. You're convinced that when you eat sugar alcohols, nothing happens. That's not true. There is no such thing as a free lunch, ever. 
I don't care if it doesn't impact you calorically, it impacts you. If you eat something, your body has to attempt to do something with it, okay? So sugar alcohols go into your gut and they have different impacts. Some overfeed, some create things. Uh, there's studies actually, erythritol on me, we kind of have a weird relationship. Uh, but studies have come out that it actually helps produce uh, short chain fatty acids in your gut when it gets broken down, right? So like, it does things like that. What, which is funny though, is fatty acids have calories. So something that's not calorically impactful, it seems like it's kind of impacting you calorically, I'm just saying. Um, but erythritol also is a case-by-case -case basis. And then allulose is not a sugar alcohol. I'm not still on the fence about allulose, but it's probably my favorite. Like if you're gonna have a zero caloric sweetener, allulose is definitely my favorite one. Uh, but all in all, like, 90% of the time, I avoid all of these. Okay, I avoid all of these. Because um, they can lead to bloat and overpopulation. I'm not saying like if you have a really big stomach after you ate a meal that like you destroyed yourself, but like pain, like real bloat and pain. That can be caused by erythritol, xylitol, allulose, uh, circulose, all these things that can negatively impact our gut and that relationship. Okay, so you might be asking, all right, well, John, so you don't eat anything sweet. You're such a loser. No, 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 don't get me wrong, I like sweet stuff. So what do I eat? What do I eat? I eat real food carbs. So when I create something sweet, and I do this with all my clients, I don't eat a keto bar. I eat a bowl of berries. I will have berries with cream, or I will have an apple with peanut butter, something like that, all within ketogenic macros. I don't go over my macros when I eat, right? Which makes me limited because, man, I mean, an apple's like 20 carbs, like, if I'm gonna eat that, I'm done for the day. It's carnivore from there on out, which is fine because it helps me have be in control. I like that, no problem, right? So, second thing on the sugar alcohol before I jump into this, because this is probably my favorite part of this presentation, I'm gonna blow your minds. So, understand the syphilitic insulin response. Ooh, anybody know what that is? Okay, so what that is is that when you eat something sweet, your body releases insulin to proactively prepare for the blood sugar, okay? And it doesn't happen when you have sugar alcohols. So what happens? Your insulin lowers your blood sugar from baseline, right? Anybody know what that term is called when your blood sugar is lower than baseline? Hypoglycemic, oh, yeah, got it. So syphilitic insulin responses with sugar alcohols create what's called a hypoglycemic response. This can lead to cravings because now your body releases cortisol, it releases glucagon, it increases blood sugar back up, and usually it surpasses where it was supposed to, and so you get this which is why when people eat sugar alcohols, they tend to have cravings. It's because you've really disrupted your blood sugar regulation, okay? So I have two, I have two things here. I don't know if everybody can see this on that, so I'm gonna move this spot. That is a heavy pot. Uh, all right, so both of these. I ate two different kinds of foods, okay? This is crazy. So that first one, right below the, the beautiful peanut butter cookies. Um, so that, believe it or not, was a Lily's bar. That's a Lily's bar. So it went up 13 points, which isn't terrible. It's not terrible. I've been in the blood sugar world for a while. It's not terrible for your, your food to make you rise 10 points, 13 points. What bothers me is it never went back down. Look at that. And look, and look right, you see the 78 where I started? Look at that dip. It went down into the 50s when I was eating something that had no sugar in it because it triggered an insulin response in me, right? And so I got this huge dip and then this crazy elevation for hours. My blood sugar never regulated back to normal that day. Not once, not once, okay? This one right here, I like this one. So this one right here is berries and heavy cream. Okay, berries and heavy cream. I've also seen similar results with uh, uh, apples and almond butter, uh, with bananas and stuff. Uh, just fats, right? This is one of my big rules too. No naked carbs. One of the things why people, some people don't get impacted by sugar alcohols is because keto cookies happen to have 500 calories of butter in them. So it kind of blunts some of that blood sugar response. Never, you should never have, uh, in my opinion, right? I'm one guy, but you shouldn't have blood sugar, you shouldn't have fat, or you shouldn't have carbs by themselves. But look at that. Yes, so it rose actually, so that number there you don't see is 100. So I was fasted at 88 that day, and it went to 100, which is 12 points. It rose less than the Lily's bar. That's a fact, you can't dispute that. That's, that's, that, you can't argue it. But look at what happened. It went back down to baseline in less than two hours. I had a proper insulin blood sugar response to that, that guess what, did not lead to cravings. I was satisfied. I satisfied that and I was done. Our ancestors, when they were hunting and eating thousands of pounds of meat to satisfy those big brains they were developing, did not walk past a bush and see a bush of keto cookies. And like, 
oh, chocolate chip today. This is awesome. <laughs> no, they saw berries. They saw hanging fruit, right? And they ate one or two, and they moved on with their lives, right? And our bodies... So something that we do in the keto space is we talk about how one, one of the missing links in our diet is that when we, uh, because we don't eat fat, it's something that we evolutionarily adapted to using fat as fuel, which is why the ketogenic diet feels so good. Guys, we adapted to the way we eat protein and carbs too. Our body has evolved over all those micronutrients. So the way that we act with our carbohydrates matters too. The way that we act with our carbohydrates matters too. And I really press this on because I've seen people that come to me that are eating 50 total carbs. And all I do is make them eat nothing but whole food carbs. They can have some green veggies if they want. If they're craving something sweet, I want them to have a sweet potato or fruit. I know it's getting controversial here. But do that, and all of a sudden, they start losing weight. Their body relaxes. They, 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 they break the plateau that they have. They stop overfeeding, right? Because it's no longer putting my hand back in the cookie jar. It's, okay, my bowl of berries is done. And they move on with their lives, right? Your body physiologically has a better response to it. Okay, so just it, it, it is something that has really, really, really changed my life. I really got control of myself when I adopted this the, 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 this approach. I really did. Whole foods first. So how's the ninety ten work into this? Ninety percent of the time, I when I crave something sweet or I need it because I'm a runner and that's not the talk or I've been here for a couple hours, um, then I will have something like whole food, right? Whereas ten percent of the time, if I'm on a date or I'm here, right? I may I may have something that has some ingredient I'm nec not necessarily a proud of, but like I eat it because 10% of the time, I do it because I know 90% of the time I'm a savage, right? 90% of the time, be a savage. 10% of the time, you know, enjoy yourself, right? And that's kind of, it's called balance, right? It's called balance. Um, but this really changed my life and I cannot drill this home enough. It was interesting because when I went keto, the fat story, I just learned more and never really changed. What's really changed for me over the course of the past five years I've been doing this is how we interact with carbohydrates, which is hilarious because it's a keto diet and carbs aren't supposed to be part of the conversation, but it's like the longest. Like, all my talks, carbs have like the most slides. It's always the most talked about thing because it's so controversial and how we handle it though matters. So the next thing, and this is me getting a little hippie on you, but I'm really passionate about this. Guys, we have no connection to anything in a bag. At all, like we have no physiological connection, no natural connection, nothing. Okay. However, when we grow something, we do. We do. I want you to see these two things. Okay. So this is photosynthesis. Everybody know photosynthesis? Oh yeah, yeah. Y'all went to school. Nice. I like it. I like it. So photosynthesis is when the sun hits a plant and it turns it into food. Okay. We do the same thing. When we're in front of the sun, we create vitamin D, which leads to testosterone, which helps us look primal and ready for reproduction, right? Like, and that's the truth, sorry, I'm just being honest. Uh, but that's the thing, we do the same thing. We have a natural commonality with these plants. They're part of our ecosystem, right? There's a thing called grounding, everybody know what grounding is? Oh uh, yeah, see, if you're in the keto space, it's like, Grounding, sleeping, water, and butter. Like, you know all those things, right? <laughs> so grounding, the reason why grounding works, and we have studies that it works, is because we share frequencies with the ground. There's a frequency that our body has, we're electromagnetic units, and our body shares that frequency with the dirt that we stand on. That's why it's so impactful and powerful. Guys, these plants share the same frequency. They're literally producing the fruit and the vegetation that you eat off of the frequencies that help you heal. Like, think about that for a second. You have a connection with these things. And I'm not saying you need to eat them, right? I'm totally cool carnivore, and I, I love it. But if you are gonna have carbohydrates in some form, guys, do ones that grow out of the dirt you stick your feet in. Like, seriously, okay? So, the next thing too. So, right, so it's natural, produces energy in similar ways as us. It shares frequencies with us, which I think is super important, and I just love. Natural carbohydrates are complex. Guys, when you eat a, a Duncan Hines, everybody see those Duncan Hines keto cakes? I haven't had one yet, but they scare me because they're 50 total carbs, but they're like three net carbs, and I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> What's going on, right? But the thing is, is that those things have one kind of carbohydrate. They have one kind of carbohydrate in them, right? Sugar alcohol. A strawberry has five different kinds of carbohydrates. So I, I mapped this out here so you can see. And again, I feel like if we're gonna handle, like if somebody came up to you and said all fatty acids are the same, you would be appalled, because you know that's not true. We have to treat every macronutrient the same way if we're going to really make impact and speak in truth. 
Carbohydrates are not all the same. There's a lot of them. In fact, right here, there's 11. There's 11 of them. There's 11 different kinds of carbohydrates, right? Strawberry is made up of five. And you know what strawberries don't do? Raise your blood sugar. Most of any time. Even by themselves. Again, I would eat them with the fat, but they don't, right? Like, the food matrix matters, right? The complexity of our food matters. And the reality is, is that whole food carbohydrates mixed with the fat is better for your body physiologically and processed carbs that have fats added to them, okay? They contain antioxidants and other health properties and they elicit a proper insulin blood sugar. I'm telling you guys, I would rather somebody have a, and this is my opinion, you don't have to agree with me on this, you can walk out of the room if you want, please don't. Uh, but if the blood sugar goes up 20 points and comes back down to fasted levels within two hours, I'm much more happy with that than someone that gets a five to six point rise and it doesn't go down the rest of the day. That, that worries me more because it means that their body is like, I can't regulate, right? And that's a problem. I gotta hurry up. <laughs> so real food carbs have been shown to help with women's health on a high fat diet. I know many women in this room and outside of this room that I have helped that just eating a sweet potato the last week of their cycle every day just changes their lives. I watch people that have wake up and they've been keto for three years, high fat, no carbs at all, and they wake up and they start having like 115 on the fasting glucose, and everybody says, oh, it's fine. But it's not fine, that's not fine. Your body is stressed, right? And I don't have time to get into that, because cortisol and stuff, but, but again, we've been here for too long. Um, but just realize that like, there's a hormonal thing going on. And when you include these things, you can help regulate your cycle, you bring cortisol down. I've seen people have sweet potato for the first time in four years because I finally convinced them to do it. And two hours later, their blood sugar's in the 70s. And they haven't seen the 70s in months, right? Because they relax their hormones. Because they're not going to the keto cookie when they crave sweets. Craving sweets is definitely part of your mental addiction, but there is also some innate intelligence going on. But going to talk about innate intelligence when he talks. There's an innate intelligence. Your body craves sweets because it's stressed and it wants glucose, right? Because how does it get away from things really fast? It uses glucose. Fatty acids are not a quick firing energy source, right? So when we're super stressed and our body can't keep up with demand, exogenous carbohydrates can bring cortisol down and get our body to relax, which actually helps us burn fat better. I have a chart that I cannot show, and I wish I could. Uh, DM me and I'll share it with you. But basically, I was doing running, because what I found is endurance athletes, right there, right? It helps with endurance athletes. Share a lot of commonalities with women's women's hormones in general because of the way that cortisol regulates for both of us. And I was tricky, I was doing like 80% fat, I was in extended fasting, and nothing was working, my runs were getting worse, I was injuring myself, all this jazz. Fasting glucose, I've been keto for five years. I would consider myself relatively healthy. 120s in the morning. Like pre-diabetic, crazy, like what's going on? And I was too scared to have carbs. Like I remember like I decided one day I was gonna have sweet potato because I tried everything else. And I was like looking down on the plate and I was like, this is this is so wrong. And guess what? Two hours later, my blood sugar was 78. Right? And it was like, what's going on? Right? But it gave me power because it, what it did was it brought my cortisol. My ketones went up after having the carb. That is some psychological twisting right there. Right? And again, that's why I also preface with this conversation. You need to be fat adapted first before you dabble in this. But realizing that like they can play a role in helping you burn fat better. Your fear of them, the whole food versions, could be hindering you from going to that next level of your ketogenic diet. And I really, really mean that. All right, so I gotta hurry up. I know, I know, I'm sorry, sorry. All right, so it aids with hormones and nourish based athletes and serious athletes, and it helps with the balance of health and, and our, our guts, right? So, some practical tips. I'm gonna do this quick because I know it's like, oh, what do we do? So, practical tips here. So, cheap beef is better than a Snickers bar, okay? I'm tired of people eating the cheaper beef and some grass-fed zealot going, you're doing keto wrong, and they go, this is way too confusing, I give up. You just stop that person from healing. You just stop that person from healing, right? That's reality. Science shows the difference between grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef that is there. It's not dramatic, right? Because if we look, right? So they have what's called a ruminant. They have four chambers. And so the way that they digest and assimilate things like soybean and some of the grains that they eat is different than a cow or a chicken, or sorry, a pig and a chicken. Right, so it is different, and if you can afford grass fed, you should. Not only for the health benefits, but also because you want to support your local farmers because big food is trash. Uh, but if you need to eat this, it's better than nothing, okay? Second thing, buy leaner cuts of chicken and poultry. You guys, all the bad stuff in meat when it is raised properly is in the fat. So literally, just buy a, a jar of olive oil for $10 that can make you 40 dinners, and just buy the lean cut of pork chops, and just make an aioli sauce, right? Like, move around it. This can be doable, okay? And then beware of GMO, but not organic. Okay, I'm not organic, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Uh, some GMO can be altered and weird, right? But now that science has come out and said, like, what I mean by that is like, avoid GMO because it can be twisted in the last. But the idea is like, just like how animals and humans have evolved, plants have too. They do selective breeding too. The plant that doesn't make it doesn't make another plant, right? So like, they've been modifying themselves forever. So like, there is some gray area that's super important. Organic, except for berries, because they're probably 35 and they do get sprayed a lot. When I used to be in pest control, we newsflash, organic in the store gets pesticides on it. I just want you to know, it's called evergreen. It basically has one chemical compound that doesn't exist in it. So just so you know, organic veggies in the store get pesticide too. So, yeah, oh no. So the best thing that you can do is grow on your own, which I've started doing, or go to a farmer's market and ask them. Right, but commercial, organic, they just want to make you pay more. Honestly, the only one I would look is strawberries, because even though they still use pesticides, it's a lot less. So strawberries and berries organic is great, but like everything else, you're not, they're just charging you more, to be honest with you, I'm sorry to say. Um, okay, psychology of whole foods versus processed foods. I think this is, and I'll end with this quickly. All ultra processed foods, keto or not, are designed and tested to make you want more of them. Never forget that, okay? A lot of us are addicted to the brownie, not just the sugar. You know how many people go to keto brownies and they still can't lose weight because they can't stop eating brownies? I'm sorry, you're not just addicted to the sugar, you're addicted to the smell of it. Putting it in the oven, licking the bowl. Who doesn't lick the bowl? Everybody likes the bowl, right? You're addicted to all of it, right? You're just feeding, and that's the problem though. You can, that's why you can maintain keto for three months and then you go off of it for six months because you never dealt with the root addiction problems. If you want to deal with them, you need to adopt a whole food ketogenic diet. That's just reality. Food is not fun. And this is not a carnival ride, this is your life. Okay? But it can be a joy. Who doesn't like a good steak? I ate a lot of it yesterday, it was crazy. Right, so it can be a joy, but you need to understand you have one body, you have one life. You need to fuel it properly. That does not mean that it needs to be nasty food all the time. You can make good food. If you can't, marry somebody that can, right? <laughs> And enjoy food, but realize that it fuels this system. And I'll, sorry, I'll end with this. My eating disorder, this is super important to understand. My eating disorder did not get fixed until I put whole foods first. It just did. That's just, you can't argue with me on that. And I know many of people that would agree with me. Whole foods come first, and you have a much better chance of adopting a long-term ketogenic diet. So my encouragement to you is that is, is to really think about these things, be honest with yourself, and adopt a whole foods keto drink so that you can build your proper keto road. Thank you. Woo!